are. So we'll go ahead and get started. If you're just joining us, I'm Melissa Troutman. I'm the policy analyst at Earthworks. And I'm coming, I'm coming to you from Potter County, Pennsylvania, which um, is, are, are the ancestral lands of the Susquehannock and Haudenosaunee people, and likely others, um, other native peoples whose histories have been erased by colonialism. I'm joined tonight by Pennsylvania State Representative Sarah Inamorato, Kevin Sensky and Kristen Losey from the Center for Coalfield Justice, Dr. John Stoles of Duquesne University, and New York State Senator Rachel May, who later in the hour will discuss her groundbreaking bill passed just a few months ago, making New York State the first place in the United States to close a dangerous loophole that benefits the oil and gas industry while putting the rest of us at risk. Now this loophole exists across the United States, including Pennsylvania and New York is except, it, well, it exists across the United States except for in New York now. New York became the first place where that doesn't exist, that exemption. Justin Wasser, my colleague here at Earthworks who helped organize this event and is running tech um, for us this evening. Thank you, Justin is also with us. And as I mentioned, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen to submit questions to us. Um, and you can use the chat function to have discussion amongst yourselves. Whoops, I'm jumping ahead too much. Okay, so the hazardous waste loophole for oil and gas. So since the 1980s, the oil and gas industry has not had to comply with hazardous waste law in the United States. And that exemption from the federal law has been adopted by oil and gas states across the nation. This loophole is a free pass for oil and gas companies in the United States, and it allows potentially hazardous and radioactive materials that are in oil and gas waste to infiltrate land and water and needlessly expose workers and the public. Now there are many oil and gas waste streams, everything from liquid waste to sort of in between sludges and muds and pipe scales to solid waste. And this loophole makes it legal for oil and gas waste to be spread on roads, discharged into rivers and drinking water sources, and dumped alongside your household trash in local landfills. Now, Earthworks has detailed some of these problems in several reports. Um, the, the dangers of oil and gas waste and pull out policy solutions to fix them in several reports. A national report on the situation across the United States, but also state specific reports in New York, Pennsylvania, and North Dakota. We also have a map of everywhere in the United States that Pennsylvanians, Pennsylvania's oil and gas waste is going. And that interactive map is also on our website at earthworks.org. We'll soon have reports for New Mexico, Texas, California, Colorado, West Virginia, and Ohio as well. All the oil and gas states. In all of these reports, we call for oil and gas states to close the hazardous and radioactive waste loopholes for the industry. And the good news is it's already happened in New York and we're gonna be talking about that later. And bills exist to do the same right here in Pennsylvania. Also gonna be talking about that in a second. And there are also legislators who want to close these loopholes in New Mexico as well. Now closing these legal loopholes means that more rigorous standards are going to be applied to the industry's waste so that it's not leaching into our soil and drinking water. Later on, after we take some of your questions, we will lay out specific actions that you can take right away to get these critical protections in place here in Pennsylvania, actions that can be adapted to where you live if you're tuning in from other states. And by the way, just because you don't have oil and gas extraction in your state doesn't mean you aren't importing 
waste from oil and gas states, as New York can certainly attest to. So now I would like to bring Representative Sarah Inamorato um, into, into the room, so to speak, and get started. So in 2019, Earthworks released a report on the impacts of oil and gas waste in Pennsylvania. And we called for elected officials to close the loopholes for the industry. And one of those elected officials, freshman representative Sarah Inamorato from the 21st Legislative District, heard that call and followed up with action. So Representative Inamorato, thank you for your leadership on this issue. And to begin, um, for those of us who don't know the 21st District, I was hoping you could give us a few words to describe the communities that you represent. Sure, and um, before I do that, I just would like to say thank you so much for the work that Earthworks is doing, um, as well as the other folks that we have on this call, Center for Coalfield Justice and Dr. Soltz. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this work um, in crafting legislation if it wasn't for everyone coming to the table and helping out with that. Um, but that's kind of the spirit of the 21st district. We're all about community. And it's actually a majority urban district with the Allegheny River running right through it. Um, we have some of the worst air quality in the nation. Um, we also experience um, record flooding and landslides. So people really understand how climate change has impacted them. And there's been a lot of democratically led um, local solutions to try to address these things. So we actually have um, in our Edna borough, we have the first eco district in the world. Um, and we also have folks who are building um, air quality monitors and, um, you know, just very much there's a awareness of, of climate change and how it impacts people um, locally in their day-to-day -day lives. So our analysis at Earthworks, thank you um, for joining us again. And uh, you're right, all of the advocates who've been work who, who here tonight and far more have been working on this for so long. And so I just am so grateful for you to, for focusing on this issue. Um, our analysis at Earthworks has shown that the fracking industry, the waste from the fracking industry has increased a ton um, since the fracking boom began. The liquid waste alone in Pennsylvania grew by over 1500% um, from the beginning of the fracking boom to 2018. By 2014, the solid waste from this industry reached 1.6 million tons. And the numbers are, of course, are concerning, but there's no fracking in your district, if, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. And so my question is, why you? Why, why are you concerned about this issue? Why are you putting forth legislation to change it? Well, for me, it's uh, personally a, a moral imperative, right? Um, I really, when I think about this issue, I think about it in a regional context. And I think about Wendell Berry, who said, do on to those downstream as you would like those upstream to do on to you. And when we think about air quality, when we think about water quality, when we think about our collective health and well-being, um, these things know no boundaries. And when you are sworn in as an elected official in Pennsylvania, you swear in to protect all, all constituents um, across the Commonwealth and you we have a um, part of our Constitution article 1 section 27 that guarantees us all the right to pure air and clean water and you know I took that vow and I hold that um, extremely respond I hold myself responsible and accountable to that and so when um, you know earthworks and other, groups that I have a commitment to have told me about this issue, um, you know, it seems like the, the thing to get the political will uh, behind so that we can actually, um, one, educate my fellow representatives on the issue, and then have someone who is from Southwestern PA um, 
work on an issue like this because traditionally in Harrisburg, when you see pro-environmental legislation and things that actually try to hold corporate oil and gas um, entities accountable. They don't traditionally come from the western side of the state because that's kind of where that industry is thriving. So we really wanted to, to flip the narrative. Um, so it is vital to, to be able to bring that, that western PA perspective, even if it is from an urban area. We, are, we do have a history of um, legacy pollution and dealing with um, industry exploiting our people. And so there is that that common narrative that we can use to bridge the urban and rural divide. Yeah, I mean, experience, the experiences in the Rust Belt in Western Pennsylvania, um, we don't want more of the problem that we've experienced for generations. How has it been educating your fellow um, legislators? And do you, what's, what's I mean, the, the political uh, climate in Pennsylvania is, is one, obviously, you know well, um, that, you know, we have climate deniers in uh, seats of environmental leadership, and it seems like a pretty big lift to do something like close a, a, a major loophole for the oil and gas industry. So how do you think, wh what is, what's it really going to take to get this passed in Pennsylvania? How, how could advocates and the public help? Well, I think it really, um, you know, working with all of you, it's been helpful to just educate my fellow colleagues on the issue. But then, you know, it's all of our responsibilities to meet with our elected representatives and say that this issue is important to me to share those stories. I know because I will never live in the shadow of a well pad. I have gone to Washington County and I have gone on tours and I have talked to Democrats, Republicans, independents on how this issue impacts their day-to-day -day lives. And you know, the data is extremely helpful, but when you start to hear people who lost their kids to a rare cancer, when folks are, have lost their entire property value and everything they've built up, you know, it just it hits your heart, it hits your soul. And if we can humanize that policy, then I think we can really start to grease the wheels and create the change that is needed and start to get more legislators um, signed on to this bill and you know, hopefully um, moving it through the legislative process. But it's gonna, it's gonna take all of us um, because I remember getting to Harrisburg and someone said, you know, there are 203 elected representatives in the PA House and there are 203 oil and gas lobbyists. So the only way that we push back against that kind of concentration of power and wealth is collectively. Um, we got more people and so we need to make sure that Harrisburg recognizes that. So you mentioned your bill. What exactly does your bill do? So it closes a number of loopholes. Uh oh, I think we lost the representative. Hmm. Well, I'm sure she'll join us shortly. Um, nope, that's not her. So I guess I'll speak a little bit for her um, until she gets back. Um, Representative Intermorado has, um, has two bills uh, that, there you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I got bumped <laughs> up <laughs> <at land. laughs> um, about your bills. Yeah, so it, it closes some loopholes. Um, so the one is that uh, we often think about the extraction process, but we don't think about what happens with all the, the waste and where it goes and how people are dealing with the immediate impacts of it and also the legacy impacts. So what this says, um, what one of our bills does is it says that, you know, municipal waste sites that feed their um, leachate, which is essentially, I call it garbage tea, um, to the wastewater treatment plants that eventually go into our public waterways. Um, it says that we have a criteria for testing so if you are um, going to accept oil and gas waste, that it must um, be tested for the hazardous criteria. 
um, which is just applying other standards in other industries to the oil and gas industry. Um, and the, uh, you know, the other thing it, it does is just saying that, it, you know, once this, um, this, this material, we, we just need to put the same application of standards that we put on um, other industries when it comes to disposal of it. So it's just a, really a matter of, of fairness and transparency and accountable um, accountability to the communities, not only in which the um, hazardous, um, where oil and gas operations occur, but then how it's uh, transported, stored, treated, and ultimately disposed of. Cradle to grave. We have to know what it is in order to know where to put it safely. Well, thank you, Representative. I'm going to move us on to a couple of other folks here tonight. Um, Dr. John Stoles from Duquesne University. And also, um, and let me stop sharing my screen for a moment. There we go. Dr. John Stoles from Duquesne University and Heaven Senske, who's a community organizer from the Center for Coalfield Justice and works with impacted residents. They're both doing a really amazing work. And Dr. Stoles, I would like to start with you, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I know that you've done a lot of testing of drinking water sources um, and rivers um, in the many years that I've known you. Um, what is it particularly about the oil and gas waste issue in Pennsylvania with the loopholes that we have in place? What is it that concerns you most about that? What are the, what are the problems that this is leading to? Well, as Sarah had alluded to, uh, it's a question of where the waste is going. And early on uh, in my studies, I learned about the composition of the, the, what they call the produced water from the wells. And every one of these wells that they've drilled in uh, the last, say, decade, have these condensate tanks that collect the fluids that are generated over time. And for me, the, the first loophole, if you will, was the fact that the, the these tanks that store this fluid is they're placarded for hazard and flammable, so it's toxic and flammable. And yet when it goes to the truck for disposal, it becomes residual waste. And therein lies a whole bunch of applications and whatnot, as you said uh, earlier. And then going to the landfill issue, I was alerted back in 2014 by a fellow down in Ross Draver. He was worried about the radioactivity. He had a detector around his neck and he said watch what happens every time we're downwind of the landfill the radiation increases and it was like well how is that possible and that's when I found out that the landfills in Pennsylvania are allowed to take 80 percent volume per day so for every 10 pounds of garbage 80 you know eight pounds of that could be in drilling you know oil and gas waste and then some other analysis I've done on various fluids, we found evidence for um, radon, radon-226, radon-228. Uh, and I was scratching my head, well, that included in the landfills the liquids. And all they had to do was like put it in kitty litter or put it in, in wood chips to absorb that, and it was all going into the landfill. Well, as you mentioned, or as Sarah said, the, the, the tea, if you will, the landfill tea that we call leachate, um, I've gotten and analyzed samples of that stuff. And again, it, it, in a landfill that's taken this oil and gas waste for years, now their leachate, which is supposed to be sanitary landfill, has now all the constituents, the bromide, the salts, the heavy metals and everything else from the oil and gas waste. And it's radioactive. And because it's legally now called leachate, they we're shipping it down to the little waste plant in Belvernon, and it completely overwhelmed the plant. So that, you know, not only did very poorly treated sewage be, were being discharged, but also this diluted waste was also going into the Monongahela. And guess what is just two miles downstream? The Charleroi drinking water facility, that, 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 that they were intaking this, this stuff, and again, you connect the dots, they're having issues with their water quality. And, uh, and surprisingly, since the injunction went in and the little Bell Vernon waste treatment plant isn't taking this stuff anymore, problems seem to have solved themselves. So there's a direct connection with the radioactivity and the toxic waste. 
and that's why this has to be addressed, and that's why I'm glad this legislation is being proposed. Radium, radon, these are carcinogens, right? Right. Well, uh, should make a point. So even though you know they're allowed to do this, and it, in a specific load, say, might be able to pass muster, okay? Because they do have to test these loads for radioactivity. Mm -hmm. But the fact, the mere, the sheer volume that's being taken, and it's cumulative. Right. So it builds up. And so the radium has, radium-226 has a half-life of 1,600 years. So it's not going away. And what does it decay to? It decays among other things, to radon-222. So what we're seeing, and there's a study uh, done in upstate New York, they had phenomenal numbers of radon coming off this one particular landfill. And it was directly associated with the, rad uh, the, the radium in, in, in the waste. In the oil and gas waste that was in coming off the, the landfill? Waste, yeah. right. So each load is being tested, and each load is in compliance. But the problem, of course, is that load gets stacked on load on top of load years and years and years and then these radioactive materials which take hundreds of years or more to break down simply accumulate and then that's the problem it's not the individual load that's the problem it's the accumulation right and it's the same thing that we saw initially they were allowed to bring the brine directly to the wastewater treatment plants and dilute it uh one in a hundred but nobody did the math to see that the, the, this brine is so concentrated that you know you 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 can't dilute it to the point where it's safe, and so you know it has to be treated in another way. And and uh, again, it's all been you know cost and saving the industry money. But as we like to say in in, in the life cycle assessment, it's externalizing costs that really need to be borne by the, the companies. And, and now we have all these landfills across the state. You've done a great job with your organization showing where all these landfills are. It's not just one, it's, it's over a dozen, maybe two dozen of these landfills across the state. And even New York State has been taking this stuff. So um, anything that this stuff ta uh, touches becomes tainted with the toxins and the radioactivity. Well, you spoke of externalities and that is, um that's what I want to talk with you about, Heaven. Um, so at CCJ, as a community organizer, you work directly with communities. And so what do these exemptions from important protective laws mean for the communities that you work with? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Stoltz. It never gets easier to hear all of that. Um, but again, my name is Heaven. Uh, I'm a community organizer with the Center for Coalfield Justice. Um, I organize around the impacts of oil and gas development in Washington and Greene counties here in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, I myself am an intergenerational resident of Washington County, um, and I live on a small farm that's been in my family for generations. So I personally have been impacted by oil and gas development and that lack of oversight that we're talking about. Um, that allows our communities to really be taken over. Um, when the Pittsburgh Post Gazette released a story on the high numbers of viewing sarcoma in our community, it was very frightening to me. Um, viewing sarcoma is a rare bone cancer, often occurring in children and young adults. Um, and typically, there are only about 200 cases per year in the United States. Uh, several of my classmates from my alma mater of Cannon McMillan High School had been impacted by Ewing sarcoma, uh, and my friend Luke Blanock had passed away of it in 2016. Um, so what that post-cassette story did was it told us that there were 27 cases of Ewing sarcoma just in southwestern Pennsylvania, a cancer that we only see 200 cases of per year. Uh, it had never occurred to me that there may be a greater cause of these cancers, uh, but I couldn't ask, help but ask why here? You know, why were there so many? Why here? And this was early on in the conversation. Why are there so many instances of kids getting sick in the rural corner of southwestern Pennsylvania? And why aren't more people asking that question? Um, so when the Pennsylvania Department of Health released data that claimed we had no cancer cluster, um, <laughs> They held a public meeting at Cannon McMillan High School in the same auditorium that I had sat 
countless times with my former classmate and classmates of other classmates that also were sick. Um, and we knew at that time that they had not included several of the Ewing's cases in their data um, due to the heroic organizing of, of local mothers and impacted families. Um, and despite showing us that there had been a 125% increase in bone cancer since 2008 in Washington County alone, they told us it wasn't anything to worry about because, quote, it wasn't statistically significant and that there were more kids with cancer in Pittsburgh. It was offensive. It was offensive. Um, as you can imagine, I was furious. Um, I felt as though they were trying to appease us into stopping the organizing that we were doing. Um, I was not satisfied. And the more I organized around this, the more I learned about the ways in which oil and gas operations in my community had gone unchecked and unmonitored. When there are 27 cases of a rare childhood cancer across rural communities, and the only common denominator is the explosion of oil and gas, of the oil and gas industry, and the massive amounts of radioactive waste that they have brought from deep into the earth to the surface of our communities, there's a problem. When those same operators refuse to cooperate with research and refuse to release, quote, proprietary information of the contents of the waste and drilling materials that they're using in my backyard, one cannot help but feel like something is being hidden. I cannot say it enough. If what the waste, if the waste produced by well pad operations is safe enough to be disposed in our communities, I want to know what's in it, and I want a separate entity to prove it. Children are being buried here. I am unapologetically sure of the fact that if their waste is safe, we deserve to know that and definitively. Um, I work closely with a number of families in our community directly affected by these rare cancers. All we want to know is that our community is safe. And this massive industrial activity happening in our backyards has to follow the rules like everyone else. I mean, this is close to our homes. This isn't a concentrated area of development. This is 1,500 well pads across a single county. There's three within a half mile of where I'm sitting right now. Uh, yet for a decade, many of our legislators have remi remained silent or resistant at least to holding the oil and gas industry accountable to what they're doing. You know, we must ask how many children's lives have to be lost before our lawmakers take action and even entertain the question. One simple step they can take now, thanks to Senator Muth and Representative Inamorato, is to support this legislation and close this loophole. This is a clean bill. It's simple. For the safety and well being of my community, I implore you all to please consider what it might feel like to walk through your own grass and wonder if it's poisoning your children. Consider what it might feel like to bury your friends and realize that the leaders of your community are ignoring your questions of why. I truly don't believe that we're asking for much. If it's safe, let us see it. Thank you. Thank you, Heaven. And it's astonishing that we're sitting here having this conversation to begin with. Um, and that 16 years after the fracking boom began in Pennsylvania, companies are still not required to tell us um, who live in these communities what is being put into our land, in our water, in our air. You're absolutely right. This is very simple. It's a simple, it's a matter of transparency and disclosure and public, this is health and safety data. And by denying health and safety data to people, especially given the cancer cluster and other types of sickness, it's, uh, there's, I mean, how many words can I not say on this program right now that fit, that would be appropriate for describing that? Um, but 
Thank you. Um, we're going to talk some more with Heaven and Dr. Stoles and Representative Intermorato in a little bit when we do a Q&A. But first, I want to bring in uh, New York State Senator Rachel May because she is one of the legislators in New York who closed the hazardous waste loophole for the state of New York, um, which is what we're trying to do here in Pennsylvania too, and which is also important to do in other states where there is either oil and gas extraction happening or where um, oil and gas waste might be, might be imported from oil, other oil and gas states. So let me, let me, I want to introduce Senator May, but first I want to share my screen again and I, I want to just play with, for you a brief one minute video of Senator May's speech on the Senate floor in New York about this bill. If you just bear with me for a moment and I can find where that is. It was right there. There it is. I want to thank my colleagues and the majority leader for supporting this important bill and the advocates who have worked so hard to raise awareness about this issue. New York State has wisely banned fracking, largely to protect our land, water, and air from harmful environmental impacts, but we unaccountably exempt fracking waste and other wastes from oil and gas extraction from our hazardous waste regulations. Over 600,000 tons of solid waste and 23,000 barrels of liquid waste from fracking in Pennsylvania have made their way into our state, possibly containing benzene, formaldehyde, and other carcinogens, as well as radioactive elements. The hazardous waste loophole must finally be closed for the safety of all New Yorkers and our natural resources, and it gives me great pride to sponsor this legislation and see it finally pass in the Senate for the first time. Thank you. So I'm going to actually stop sharing so that we can, um, we can see everybody, but Senator May, Thank you so much for making time to be with us tonight. Um, My pleasure. Yes, thank you. It's so nice to, nice to virtually meet you. And thank you so much for your work in New York. Um, in New York. I, you're a freshman? I am. Right? Yep. Okay. So yeah, so like Representative Intermorato, you guys are new to this elected official thing, and and yet you're doing work that advocates like us have been have wanted to be done for a long time. And there are many advocates alongside Earthworks who've been pushing to close loopholes and properly manage oil and gas waste in New York. Um, why you? Why, is, why was this important for you as a senator? Well, it may not be an accident that we're both freshmen. I, I think you come in with new eyes and you see this is ridiculous that this hasn't passed. And for other people, maybe it just seemed like the, the landscape that we had. And it, so I think it does take new people sometimes to, to ask those questions. But in my case, before I ran for office, I was working at Syracuse University as, as the Director of Sustainability Education, and I have a degree in environmental science from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So these issues have been in the front of my mind for a very long time. I was involved in, in the anti-fracking movement in New York State, I love that you started by saying that you're on, you are located on the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee because I also am, and not only that, but Onondaga Lake, which borders on the city of Syracuse where I live and which I represent, is really the heart and soul sort of center of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It's where the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was founded and it's one of the most polluted lakes in the entire country. And I've worked on Onondaga Lake and the Onondaga Lake watershed for a long time and worked with, with the Onondaga Nation on really getting the word out about that. And the pollution there is a different matter, but, but this whole question of, 
water quality and what we've done to our waterways is something that is kind of deep in my heart. I, I will also say I'm chair of the Commission on Rural Resources in the New York State Legislature, largely because in our democratic conference in the Senate, I am the only Democrat between Albany and Buffalo. That's like 300 miles of rural New York that has no other majority member than me. <laughs> And so I have de facto, though my district is, is more limited, I represent the Finger Lakes and the Adirondacks and the Susquehanna Valley um, in the state Senate because my, the remainder of my colleagues in the majority are mostly from New York City and Long Island. So I feel like I'm responsible at some level for this entire region's uh, water quality and, and our water is probably, you know, the most important thing we have here. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the other thing is just before, so I had introduced this bill because advocates had come to me and, and it felt really important for all of the reasons I just said. But then in April, I looked, because Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection publishes where the fracking waste goes. And I looked and um, the, the state, our State Department of Environmental uh, Conservation had said that they, we weren't actually taking any more fracking waste. <laughs> and they were saying, we don't need to pass this bill because we don't do that anymore. And I thought, well, I'm gonna look. And sure enough, there was a shipment from Pennsylvania in April that came to Syracuse. So it came like into my backyard. And that made it a little more personal yet to me that this was, you know, what an insult to them. <laughs> they're saying it's not coming at all. And here it's coming right into my hometown. I'm familiar with that site specifically. It seems strange to me. Why is it going up to to, uh, to Syracuse? There's a trans, it's a, called a transfer station. Right. Um, so it's moving through, and I know there's a rail yard there. I've been meaning to follow up and mm -hmm. get dig into what exactly is happening at that facility in Syracuse. But um, what did it take to, to, to get this done in New York? What did it take to actually close this loophole? Was it a huge lift? For, for you guys or? You know, it wasn't that heavy a lift in our, in our conference now that we have. So, so I ran in 2018, when I ran the, the New York State Senate was controlled by Republicans and had been pretty much continuously for about 80 years. And we finally flipped the, the Senate in 2018. So now that we have a majority, we're able to take up things that have been just tabled for decades so it so it was possible to do this time and we passed it but as i said the state department of environmental conservation did not believe that we needed to do it and um was advocating against it and so the the heavy lift was getting the governor to sign it and that was a matter of this was such a priority bill for advocates we in 2019, we passed our Climate and Community Protection Act, which is a very strong climate bill, and that had been the focus. But this year, actually, the, the closing the fracking waste loophole was one of the big focal points for environmental advocates. And so uh, with their help, we got it not just passed, but signed into law. Well, thank you again. I look forward to watching how this plays out in New York and, per, and I look forward to participating with alongside our allies in New York to, to meet with the Department of Environmental Conservation and see how this hazardous waste law is going to be applied to oil and gas waste. And also what impacts that has um, in Pennsylvania. I mean, if, if it's harder for it to cross the border, then it, and it does, it stops crossing the border, of course. One of the things that the industry does, and one of the reasons why we still advocate for a closing of the federal loophole in addition to individual state loopholes is because um, 
industries will flock to the, they'll take the path of re least resistance. They will take their ways to the places where it's allowed to go. And so until we have that opportunity to do something about it at the federal level, we really need to focus on the state. So thank yeah. you again for doing your part. My pleasure. And th it's very exciting when, when you have a bill and then it spreads to other states or, you know, there are companion bills in other states. It, it feels like we're part of a, of a movement, which is really great. So I appreciate the work all of you are doing, and I'm looking forward to seeing this happen in Pennsylvania, too. Awesome. Well, with that, um, let's take some questions, shall we? Um, we have Representative Inter Murado, we have Senator May, we have Heaven Sensky, we have Dr. Stoles. We also have Kristen Losey here from the Center for Coalfield Justice. Um, she, we haven't introduced her yet because her bit's coming in a little bit. She's going to give us some steps to take to stay on this um, topic moving forward. Um, and then myself, of course to take any questions that anyone might have. And we start with one that's specific to Pennsylvania. Um, John, Dr. Stoles, I think maybe you might want to hit this one first. Um, the question is, did the Westmoreland Sanitary Landfill in Bell Vernon, so that is the landfill that was taking, it was giving leachate to the municipal sewage waste treatment facility in Bell Vernon, did the landfill in, um, receive a permit to evaporate contaminated liquid uh, or contaminated liquid runoff from the oil and gas industry? Right, at, at this point, I believe the, the permit is held up, but just to rewind a bit. So after this you know, hit the papers and people realized what was happening in Westmoreland with the landfill and the waste treatment plant, um, there were injunctions, and then the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection entered into a consent agreement with them, uh, with the landfill, to deal with the issue of the leachate. And if it were just a normal sanitary landfill, they could take that leachate volume and reduce it using an evaporator. So these things are found at other landfills, but basically the permit involves you know, um, certain emissions like volatile organics and things like that, but it doesn't talk about radioactivity. And when I found out what they were going to be doing, I did a little math. And it turns out that the plan was to take this evaporation system and reduce their volumes by 95%, okay, so going from 100 down to five, of 45,000 gallons a day. Wow. And based on the, the information that I had, that we, we measured about 370 par, um, picocuries. So the, the leachate has hundreds of picocuries of this radium waste. But if you decrease the volume and you process all this, it goes from hundreds of picocuries to tens of millions of picocuries. Mm -hmm. So now suddenly you've got this radioactive waste and you don't have to measure anything. And so thankfully, then other folks at the DEP got involved. And right now, uh, as far as I know, they're not going forward. But once again, the landfill has this problem and they can't use standard solutions, low cost solutions, because their leachate is so toxic now. So what is the solution then? So let's say that um, thanks to Representative Intermorado's bills, we close those loopholes and that the waste, the waste is no longer going to our municipal landfills who cannot treat it. And they're, so that their leachate is not containing oil and gas materials and going to the sewage waste treatment facilities who also cannot treat that. Right. So where should this stuff really be going? Well, I, again, it's, it's addressing the issue, and this is not a new issue. It turns out that there was an expose done in the New York Times back in 1990, where they discovered down in Louisiana that some of the waste discharges were, were more than what the nuclear industry was allowed to discharge. So, you know, and it was affecting the equipment that they were being used. 
So, you know, this has been around for a long time. And the reason, again, it's all about cost and keeping costs down, because right now we are generating one trillion gallons of produced water and other liquid wastes from this unconventional oil and gas industry. One trillion gallons a year. Right. And they need a place to put this, but they don't want to address the fact that it's toxic, it's radioactive, and needs to be addressed appropriately because the dollar signs start building up and you go from six cents a gallon to three hundred dollars a gallon so first step is to think you know recognize the fact that this stuff is really toxic and has to be dealt with in an appropriate manner representative intermorado or anyone else do you want to hit that a little bit or we can move on to. I, I just want to add to the question about um, the evaporated contaminated runoff. Um, that permit is held up the last we checked, um, but hundreds of residents have submitted comments asking them that they get clarity on how they will handle that radiation. Um, and the DEP sent the operator those comments. So. Hopefully we hear back, um, but folks on the ground are organizing there and are trying to fight that from happening. And I think just from a global perspective, um, when we think about our permitting process and who it's designed for, right? It's designed so it's the easiest for industry to be able to operate. Um, so it is something that um, gives industry a, per, um, a permission slip to pollute at the expense of the health and well-being and economic vitality of communities in which it operates and it gives them no legal recourse or very little re le legal recourse to actually hold um, that industry operating in their backyards accountable so we have this backwards regulatory environment so this is one issue that we're addressing but we really need to look at the way that we issue permits and why we allow um, certain industries to to get a pass when it comes to operating in our own backyards speaking of our backyards what is it that we can do to build support for closing the loophole in um in pennsylvania what can we do to support your bills representative actually we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second i think kristen well, Kristen's going to share with us um, some actions that we can take through CCJ. But before that, Representative, is, if there's anything else that you want to share with folks about how to support you. I would say, you know, don't get in, first of all, like, don't get intimidated by the issue. We've, we've talked a lot about the technical pieces of this legislation and what it does. And I have to say, a year ago, I didn't know anything about this. I just knew that I had to do the right thing. And it's because folks like you, Melissa, and Earthworks, and, and Dr. John Stoltz, and, and um, all the wonderful, powerful women at the Center for Cultural Justice, you know, helping to educate me and really participating in this experiment of co-governing is that I've learned a lot. And so you don't need to be an expert. You just need to share how this is impacting you. And, you know, as someone who lives in Pittsburgh, um, I know I can't have a strong urban core if I don't have strong rural communities. So it's an economic development issue for me, right? Like businesses don't want to move to Pittsburgh because of our poor air and water quality. And rural communities cannot thrive and be independent and democratic if they don't have um, the solutions to be able to develop their own local economies. Um, it's an issue of worker safety, right? If workers don't know what they're transporting, they're unintentionally exposing themselves to toxic materials, which can have long-term health impacts, right? Um, it's a matter of public health. We heard from Kevin, right, the heartbreaking stories of uh, like young people dying of rare cancers um, and, you know, several steps downstream um, in, in Pittsburgh, we have, you know, higher rates of childhood asthma. And across the Commonwealth, we have some of the highest rates of cancer in the nation. And the other states that have other high rates of cancer are Louisiana and West Virginia and Ohio. And not to say that it's all caused by environmental um, uh, 
issues, but you know, it does us a supreme disservice by not factoring that into the public health equation when we're thinking about these solutions. So any of these other things impact all of our lives. So really just finding what's, what's in it, um, um, for you and your community and what drives you to do this work, um, that's enough to be able to facilitate that conversation with your elected representatives. Can I break in here too? I'm sure that this is not that different in Pennsylvania than it is in New York. So if you have that many lobbyists for the oil and gas industry, one per member, basically, what one thing they're going to do is they're going to write letters of opposition to this bill and it's going to go to all of the legislators and when they're thinking should I vote for this they're going to see this information like oh no the oil and gas industry says vote against it. If you belong to any civic groups and they can write a letter of support for this bill with you know explaining why they support it that will sit there and you know starting to balance out what the what the oil and gas lobbyists are going to be doing automatically because they're paid to do it. It's their job to do that. So the more you can balance the lobbying that is inevitably going to go on from the oil and gas industry, the better, both as individuals, but also I find, at least in New York, if, if when groups write those letters, they, they carry a little more weight. Thank you for sharing that. We will get writing some letters. <laughs> All right, we are five minutes before the hour and I want to um, I want to give the floor to Kristen Losey at the Center for Coalfield Justice um, to share with you all um, a very specific action that we that you can take to stay um, engaged with this issue. In order to do that, I'm going to share my screen because she has a couple of slides. So just one second. And I wanna make sure you can see Kristen when she is talking to you. I don't know where she is over. This isn't right. Like, anyway, Kristen, feel free to take it away. Cool, cool. I'll try to move Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Losey. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Center for Coalfield Justice. And I actually went to school with Heaven, so this is an issue also very close to me because a number of my peers have also been affected by um, rare cancers that have happened in this area. So I just want to thank everyone on this panel for their hard work and everyone for taking the time to attend this meeting tonight because it's a really important issue. And I know it's really overwhelming and scary, but we got this and you can take action right now. So you can see the screen here. I know you guys all probably have your phone next to you. I know most people have Facebook Messenger. It's okay if you don't, but if you have your phone, Facebook Messenger, you can scan that QR code there on the right or into your browser. You can also just type in that link that's blue on the left. And that will also be put in the chat. And I'll give you guys a minute to do that. Cool. I hope you guys, I hope you guys were able to do it. Could I have the next slide? So I know the slide's kind of overwhelming, but I promise it's easy. It just walks you through it pretty much automatically. So step one, you just press the protect our health button. And this is just going to add you to a list through the Center for Coalfield Justice. So when we have a petition around this issue, letters to sign, we can just super easily send it to you. I know we all get a million emails and it could be hard to keep track. So this is just an easy way to do it and we won't spam you. It's just us. So don't worry. And the second step is in the little second part in the middle there, you click that little share button. And you gotta, you gotta share it with your friends. We would love you if you would do that. And if you would like, you could share in the chat how many friends you've shared it with. A little competition, you might win a prize. 
<laughs> share with the most friends. <laughs> And then we're gonna ask for your email and stuff. If you'd like to give that to us, that'd be awesome. If not, that's cool too. But if you guys have any questions, put it in the chat. Also my email just happens to be right there on the right. So you can also just email me, but hope you all were able to do it. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'm trying to do it on my phone, but my messenger, it, it's not quite working for me right now, but I'm going to follow up and do that. Perfect. Since, I'm, since we're always on our phones anyway, this is a really convenient way to keep in touch with this and the work that CCJ is doing on it. Um, Earthworks, of course, is going to stay engaged on this. We're going to put um, our hearts and souls into this campaign, this push to close the hazardous waste loophole and the radioactive waste loopholes in Pennsylvania. Um, on the screen right now, you'll see some contact information for the folks that were speaking this evening, Dr. Stoles at Duquesne, Heaven and Kristen at CCJ, and then that is my email um, at Earthworks. And for all of the registrants, we can follow up with um, the recording of this webinar, our contact information, and answer any questions that we did not get to tonight. Um, ah, it's Sarah, this representative Inamorado has shared her email address as well in the chat. So please take that down before you head out. And um, I guess moving forward, or I just before in, or in closing, I just want to give everyone um, of our panelists a chance to say any last words or thoughts or advice or anything that you want to our audience before we say goodnight. Just keep up the good work. Thanks, Dr. Stoles. Olivia did the action. Thank you, Olivia. Representative? <laughs> um, you know, our greatest strength right now in addressing this global pandemic and the compounding crises is that a lot of our communities were facing, whether it was gentrification and displacement and lack of health care or lack of investment in our communities, um, our greatest strength is coming together and figuring out how to solve these problems across boundaries, whether they're urban rural divides, whether they're racial divides, um, whether they're class divides, um, but austerity and has hurt us all. It's caused lead in our waters in our cities and it's caused um, small coal towns to be decimated and we have to ask, why that is um, and it's because the folks who've had the most power have been the richest among us and that wealth and power has been concentrated over decades and this is the result that we get right this battle this is just one of many that we're fighting but we have to realize how they're all systemic and they're deeply deeply interconnected um, and that to address this is to also um, stand with our you know sisters and brothers and siblings who are working on other injustices and so you know it doesn't stop with this issue and also there's so much help um, that exists by integrating ourselves in all of these other uh, issues of really seeking justice for you know every member of our society. Thanks, Sarah. I see it, uh, a comment by Roxanne in the chat. Much work to do, but many hands lighten the load. And I think that's a good place to end. So thank you all for joining us and we will follow up with the recording. Please reach out to us if you need anything at all. And let's close the loopholes for the oil and gas industry, take away their free pass and and put into place protections that should have been here all along. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.